Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, uh, two amazing speakers. I am going to introduce the first one first, and then uh, when just before um, Nimo Basi speaks, I will introduce him in more detail. Um, my our first speaker uh, is um, uh, Boa uh, Mohane. Uh, who is the author of this amazing book that we published uh, recently, We Rise for Our Land, Land Struggles and Repression in, in Southern Africa, uh, which is available from the Daraja Press website. Um, and uh, Boa is uh, based at the Institute of Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies at the University of Cape Town, South Africa as a postdoctoral researcher and is also a fellow of the International Research Group on Authoritarian and Counter Strategies of the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. He's also an associate fellow at the Center of African Studies at Waterford University in, in uh, Mozambique. Um, boy, uh, and I go back a long way and he has been uh, responsible for assisting us in the translation of some of our uh, previous books, including one by Nemo Basi, uh, The Cooking of the Continent, which he will talk about a little later on. So with, with, with much warmth, uh, Boa, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar and um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Comrade Firaz, I want to thank you uh, in the name of, I mean, uh, as a uh, director of the Raja Press and uh, the co-organizers of this um, this course. I think it's an it's an amazing uh, initiative. So congratulations for put uh, this course together. Um, as you were introducing me, I was thinking about uh, this book you you mentioned, which I still read today. Of Nemo Vasey, I translated it 10 years ago, and it's still very important uh, for us to understand uh, processes of um, extraction and exploitation in the continent. And I think you guys are going to enjoy an amazing uh, uh, conversation with Nemo Vasey. Mine is going to be very, um, very um, simple, I guess. I won't be, I won't be theoretical, um, but I, basically want to talk about the centrality of land um, in, in people's struggles historically and, and today, and uh, the role of agrarian movements in confronting or resisting uh, agrarian capitalism, or as I call, agrarian neoliberalism. And then I hope to have a moment to um, exchange ideas with you um, uh, if questions um, I'd like to st start by um, talking a bit about myself as, um, uh, I mean, in terms of my positionality, because I think that it's important to, loc to locate where we are in terms of, you know, uh, how we approach um, uh, knowledge and how we approach um, uh, science. So I consider myself to be a scholar activist, um, and I apply a scholar activist perspective in, in my work. And according to June Boras, a scholar activist is someone who explicitly aims not only to interpret the world in an academic way, but also to change it. Um, and who is connected to a political project or a movement oriented towards social, social justice. So I, I do my work um, very closely with agrarian movements. Um, very close to UNAC in Mozambique. I'll talk a bit more about UNAC later and also Via Campesina and other movements. Um, so a scholar activist, which is also connected to participatory action research is actually a rigorous academic work that aims to change the world, right? Or committed uh, activist work that is informed by rigorous academic research, which is explicitly and unapologetically connected to political projects or movements. This is a beautiful uh, definition by, by June Boras. Um, and our comrades and, and, and Mwalimo, professor, teacher, uh, Issa Shivji, tells us that by practice, the rule of engagement with comrades should be emotionally sensitive, 
socially comradely and politically connected to the working people. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's about objective work, rigorous, but not necessarily neutral. So this is where I position myself um, in relation to, to the work I do. Um, in this slide, I would like to bring you or take you back to, you know, some centuries ago. Um, I think this, this um, I don't know how much you are, um, you are aware of uh, the ways in which the African continent was conquered um, by the European con continent, um, especially through the arrival of um, Vasco da Gama. Um, in um, in the Cape and then up uh, to Mozambique on his way to uh, to India, um, and I'm I'm bringing this because I think this marks the the a key historical moment where our continent uh, was exposed to um, invasion, um, exploration, and later exploitation, which led to what was known uh, later as colonialism, right? So these images, uh, this, um, um, these images illustrate for me uh, that very long historical process. Um, often when we talk about resistance in the continent, we, we, we talk about the struggle, you know, armed struggles of the, of the 50s and, and 60s, you know, uh, but we forget that the process of organizing our people to resist invasion uh, is as 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 uh, long as the, as as the invasion itself. So these three um, figures um, represent some of those uh, leaders who resisted uh, resisted um, uh, uh, invasion. Um, Nzingambandi um, in the territory that is today known as Angola, Gungunyan in the territory that is known today as Southern Mozambique and Chaka Zulu in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in what is today um, KwaZulu Natal area in South Africa. These are just a few uh, figures of resistance that uh, preceded uh, the you know, resistance struggles that are known um, uh, mostly in, in, in literature and in, at schools today. Um, so, um, these um, figures and images uh, actually represent the, um, the, the affirmation of colonialism, right? Colonialism as a political project um, of, um, of, of, of Europe, um, of course, it initiated um, later after, after the, the, the actual invasion. So um, the photo in or the image in your far right um, is actually what is known as a Berlin conference in the uh, 1884, 1885, when uh, the major imperial powers uh, met in Germany to divide Africa among themselves, of course, according to their own interests. So that's how today we have um, the configuration that, uh, that we have um, in the continent, most of which we did not even resolve after, 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 after you know, processes of, of independence. Uh, this photo right uh, below uh, is uh, Cecil Rhodes, uh, who had a, a, a plan to connect Cairo to, um, to Cape uh, through a railway. Of course, um, that railway uh, would serve um, nothing more than um, capital, right? To uh, to to move uh, from the continent. Uh, I mean, resources um, from the continent uh, to 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 Europe. Um, and of course, the processes of land of, of struggles um, against colonialism that were then represented through armed struggles. Um, I think a key moment is the is the Mau Mau um, um, rebellion uh, of the 1950s uh, against the then British um, uh, 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 power uh, in the in the in, in in Kenya, which in one way or another uh, I think uh, inspired 
other processes elsewhere in the continent. But what is important in all of this is that the Mau Mau rebellion uh, or up uprising uh, was basically composed by the peasantry and is, is what I want to, to discuss with you today about the role and agency of, of, of peasants in, in the continent. Am I going too fast? You can just tell me if I'm going too fast. Um, now, this uh, was another moment in the in the you know you know mid fifties, early sixties, when uh, thinking and action was brought together towards a political project of the colonization. And I think these um, two books, uh, one from uh, Franz Fanon and, and other from um, Amilcar Cabral, uh, are very key and powerful uh, resources for study to understand the ways in which um, uh, thinking was, was very important in informing you know, politically and ideologically the struggles against colonialism. And of course, these thinkers had um, a Marxist approach uh, but they did not, of course, uh, apply it without, uh, without uh, making it um, meaningful for, for the conditions, for the material conditions and historical conditions of the continent. So, um, you know, authors such as uh, Kwame Nkrumah uh, would, for instance, uh, disagree with Lenin on the issue of, you know, what is imperialism, what is colonialism, what is capitalism. And he said that, for instance, neocolonialism was the last stage of imperialism uh, to make the point that the, the colonial project in Africa has not ended uh, uh, with the end of um, the, the colonial rule, right? Which is, is a point that uh, I, I, will, I will pick later when making sense of processes of land grabbing and penetration of agrarian capital in, in our continent uh, later. But one of the most important thing I would like to realize as well here is the role of peasants, of the peasantries. These thinkers believed that in Africa, not only workers, but the peasantry uh, had um, a, a political, a political um, agency and they, they could constitute the, an important force in the process of, of liberation. So they did not uh, downplay the political a potential of the peasantry. And in fact, in most uh, countries in, in the continent, including my own country, Mozambique, um, without mobilizing the countryside and without mobilizing the peasantry, the war against um, Portugal would have not been, um, I mean, it would have been much more uh, harder. So it was important to mobilize uh, the peasantry and uh, of course, bring into, into that struggle um, ideology uh, and political direction. And so I, I, I think uh, for the interest of time, I'm not gonna go uh, uh, in details about uh, these three, uh, for me, important thinkers, but um, I will encourage you to sort of um, try to, to read their works um, um, to sort of uh, understand well uh, what I mean by by, by what I've just shared, right? So in Mozambique, for instance, um, the idea of the national liberation against the Portuguese uh, um, um, colonialism was actually uh, the idea that we need to liberate uh, not only people, not only men or you know, people, but also the land, because the land was seen as an a, a, an important central component in, 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 people, in people's liberation. You cannot liberate yourself. You see, your land is still uh, under the control of, 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 of imperialism and colonialism. So the idea was to mobilize workers and peasants to liberate the people and the land. Okay, so that was sort of an historical a context I wanted to share with you so that we understand um, my, my key argument here, which basically is that uh, the land struggles that we see today and, and the composition, the political composition of, of, of you know, uh, rural and, and, and land-based movements is not disconnected from longer processes of, 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 
of, of, of struggles, right? So what today we see has uh, agrarian neoliberalism uh, in the context of convergence of multiple crises is in my view, uh, a continuation of the same colonial project, of course, taking different forms. And if you read, for, for, ins for instance, if you, if you read the report um, by the World Bank, I think it was yeah, in, in 2008, as you can see uh, from, the, from the cover, you can you can understand how, for instance, land and agriculture was 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 perceived as um, um, key for the penetration of capital. Uh, of course, in in in, in correlation with um, with other processes, you know, extra, extractive processes such as uh, mining of 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 mineral resources and so on and so forth. So we have seen. Um, a new, what some Moyo calls a new scramble for Africa, um, and it's new. It's not. Um, it's not. It's new in the sense that it it takes a different form. Form. It's not new um, in the sense that it hasn't happened um, uh, uh, before. So it's a scramble of a new type, if you like, um, which of course involves a lot of uh, um, dispossession, eviction of of people, and violation of human rights. And this has been exacerbated. Uh, or it saw a, a very high peak um, um, around the 2007, 2008, where the world was hit by the food crisis, as well as um, uh, you know other crises, such as economic crisis and an energy crisis. Um, and of course, all these um, things have intensified processes of um, of um, neoliberalization, right? which um, in Africa after the processes of independence uh, was sort of uh, initiated through um, uh, economic adjustment programs, uh, which basically forced the states to adjust their policies towards, um, towards liberalization. Um, well, so these, these are some uh, cartoons that express actually uh, what what I'm describing. Uh, these two, I think they included in, in Nemo's book because they were uh, drawn by a comrade of, um, of, of, of ours from Mexico. Um, I was trying to locate it in the book, but actually it was drawn specifically to be included in Nemo's book. So it's, it's a great coincidence that actually we have Nemo today. So of course, what we see is a resource rush um, in the case of Mozambique where as I, I said you before, it's not only it's not only agriculture, it's also plantations, it's also mining, and also big dams, um, uh, irrigation systems, uh, conservative projects, biofuel uh, production, even ecotourism, which some could uh, believe it is progressive. Uh, it's actually um, part of a, a bigger plan to control. Uh, people's resources or the commons. So for me, this synergetic resource grabbing is a continuation of, um, of, of, a, of a colonial project uh, and imperial project that has not ended um, uh, in, 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 the, in the African continent. And of course, this has um, 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 you know, a variety of, of impacts. Uh, from social to economic to environmental, cultural, demographic, and so on and so forth. Uh, it leads to expulsion of people from their lands and from their territories. Um, it facilitates land concentration um, and it in intensifies the crisis of social reproduction, uh, which, is, which is gendered, right? Um, and I mean, there are many, many other, many other. Um, uh, consequences, but I will show you um, in a bit um, the agrarian structure of a country such as Mozambique, so that you understand the impacts of of this development in 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 you know in 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 real um, in in people's in people's life in terms of livelihoods um, and and also and also um, you know belonging, um, but. I try to understand uh, all of this. I try to understand uh, rural agency and, and, and land struggles 
by studying South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, precisely because they uh, have different political context and a bit of differences in their historical background um, uh, to have a more comprehensive uh, understanding of how uh, land struggles uh, look like today. Um, and I've been looking at the, the land reform um, uh, program of the 2000s in Zimbabwe and currently debates uh, about, you know, the need to expropriate land from white farmers in South Africa. And of course, Mozambique, uh, you know, what is happening currently in terms of uh, the penetration of, of agrarian capital. And I will talk about specifically a program and, and a capitalist agrarian program, which is Pro Savannah, um, um, of which um, I, will, I will, of course, uh, share later. And, and I also focus on, I've been focusing on three uh, specific agrarian movements in Mozambique, UNAC, in Zimbabwe, uh, Zimsov, uh, and in South Africa, the Food Sovereignty Campaign. And I chose these movement, movements, or rather these movements chose me, <laughs> I used to say that as well, uh, because they are also involved in uh, what I call cosmopolitan kind of uh, uh, perspective, because they also part of, uh, you know, the transnational agrarian movement, which is La Via Campesina, right? Um, this is a, a map of, of Southern Africa for those who have no idea. I mean, I, I also have difficulties in, in visualizing um, um, uh, places, uh, especially if I haven't been to, to, those, to those areas. Um, um, and these are the sites that I've been looking at uh, in the last uh, uh, six, six, seven years. So let me now share about Pro Savannah, which is a project that uh, was um, uh, proposed for uh, Mozambique uh, uh, in the area called Nakala Corridor, you know, central north, northern Mozambique, um, because um, it's believed uh, that that region has the same agroecological um, conditions. Um, uh, like uh, the, Cerra the, the Brazilian Cerrado area, um, where in the 60s or 70s, uh, Brazil and Japan um, um, initiated, uh, uh, you know, production uh, at a large scale of, of, of soybeans. So it's a soya kind of area today, we, which has devastated, um, um, uh, you know, biodiversity there, expelled people, entire communities, especially indigenous communities from, from the area in order to boost Brazil uh, agribusiness sector. So they wanted to replicate that in Mozambique and it was introduced around, um, uh, you know, early 2000, I mean, 2010, I think, um, uh, to sort of replicate that. Um, and also to, uh, you know, uh, introduce GMOs technologies and all of these things. Um, the issue is that that area uh, is home for uh, more than 4 million people. It's the most uh, fertile area in Mozambique and, and, of, of, and also it's quite equipped with infrastructure, which of course will facilitate um, you know, the motion of, of capital, if you like, the movement of, ca of capital um, uh, in that area at the expenses of millions of Mozambicans. So this has been resisted for uh, by 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 UNAC um, with uh, with its um, allies uh, um, from different sectors beyond beyond the agrarian right and beyond rural um, the idea was that you know Brazil would uh, provide uh, agribusiness technology and know-how uh, Japan would um, take care of um, you know export and also bring money into the project and Mozambique will definitely bless the project by you know by providing land. Now um, the the Mozambican agrarian structure today as we speak looks like this you know we are um, almost 30 million people uh, 81 percent of the economically active population work in the agriculture sector. Uh, agriculture contributes to the GDP 
with 25%, uh, which is quite uh, significant because in agrarian societies, this, this is normally um, the case. Uh, unlike industrial societies where agriculture tends to contribute very little uh, to the GDP. Um, Mozambique has uh, 36 million hectares of arable land. Pro Savannah was aiming at occupying 14 million hectares of land. So almost, you know, less, a little bit less than, than half of what is available for everybody to, uh, to cultivate. And small scale food producers or, or peasants, if you like, cultivate 97% of, of the land and the industrial sector cultivates only 3%. Um, so this is the reality that agrarian capital wants to change and shift uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the agrarian structure so that the, you know, the big agrarian capital can dominate the agricultural sector uh, and, and, and free the peasantry from the land or, or expel the, pre the peasantry from the land. And, and a variety of uh, international uh, actors um, you know, World Bank, and IMF, and northern governments, and so on and so forth, have been actually putting too much pressure into Mozambique government to actually uh, allow capital to, to penetrate, uh, which, of course, it's, it will impact um, tremendously the livelihoods and, and, you know, and, and home for, for millions, millions uh, of, of people. So these are some photos where uh, resistance to um, pro savanna uh, uh, sort of where were I mean, captured um, in various moments and various in various places. I have to say that I was part of the not to pro savanna campaign, and this explains my scholar activist approach. Because while I, I study um, this process, I also act, uh, uh, you know, actively uh, in this. Um, uh, which, uh, of course, it's what, at least for me, um, gives me a sense of, uh, you know, you know, you do academic work for what purpose? I don't do it for the purpose of doing career. I'm not a careerist. I do it in the purpose of, you know, feeding into into a process of transformation, right? So um, I also participated actively in the in the campaign against Prosavan. And finally, in, 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 in July uh, 2020, uh, Pro Savanna was declared um, um, dead by the governments of Mozambique and Brazil after almost a decade of, of, of struggle uh, um, of social movements and the peasant movement. Um, and you can see, we don't see Brazil here in this photo. We see the Minister of Agriculture in Mozambique on the right, and uh, the rep representative of uh, this is this the person on the left is uh, was in 2020 the J Japan ambassador in Mozambique. Uh, so they announced that Pro Savannah is no condition to be to be implemented because of course because of the pressure, right? The social pressure, and political pressure that was was put on them. Um, as I was saying, Brazil is not in this uh, picture because uh, due to the changes in political um, um, environment in Brazil, uh, first through the uh, impeachment of Dilma Rousseff and then the imprisonment of Lula, the new government, of course, just, um, uh, you know, they were not interested in, in, in Africa anymore, which, <laughs> you know, those are the contradiction of the left, which was played um, very, very, um, in, in the favor of, of, of the peasantry in Mozambique because Brazil was a key element in Pro Savannah as well. Uh, this is another case um, study that I follow, uh, which is Shashe in Zimbabwe. Remember I told you I, uh, I've been looking at the land reform in Zimbabwe. So this is a case, is, um, is a case I'm looking at in which um, a, a, a group of, uh, of, uh, of land occupiers uh, before the state declared land reform, uh, have uh, have occupied um, a, a, you know a, a former um, um, farm, a cattle cattle farm, um, which was owned by um, a white uh, white commercial farmer. So they kicked him out, and they built um, a new kind of revitalization. So to what uh, was before uh, one you know mono uh, 
sectorial sort of um, economic activity was transformed into a vibrant agroecological village, which uh, today um, you know hosts uh, more than four thousand uh, families. Um, they shed land. They've been put together uh, processes of 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 you know producing a diversity of uh, grains and vegetables and you know small animals and stuff like that which is today a very um vibrant kind of uh, of a village which is shashi um and the case i'm i'm looking at in south africa is a small is is not actually is not very common that uh in in our field we study churches right but churches in south africa uh um are the second is this you know the, like you know faith based organizations um are the uh, have been have land right control huge huge um tracts of land in south africa not even the state the south african state has as much land as churches in some cases churches um um provide land to the state for social projects and and so on and so forth so so Vupertal, uh, in the in the in the west coast in 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 in, in um, western cape province um uh, you know provides a very interesting case in which um residents of uh, a church mission are actually confronting the church to democratize land and asking the church to take care of the souls that live material uh, stuff uh, uh, outside of the you know church and, and bible business so it's very interesting the ways in which um uh, churches also colla co collaborate uh with with capital right with because because churches in south africa as i said represent what we can call landed elites as well right they are landed elite so they are confronted by a group of uh uh they called um the concerned moravians with a part of uh, the food sovereignty campaign. So it's a very interesting um, case also to look like in order to understand, um, you know, land struggles um, um, today. Uh, so I will I will be concluding uh, slowly. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring here the issue of uh, something is wrong there, but the issue of land and and culture, right? Uh, because, um, as I argue, land is not only a matter of, you know, productive sort of uh, factor. Um, it's also, um, it, it means much more than that for people. And when people struggle for land, it's not only for, to have a piece of, you know, of, of, of land to grow cassava or, or maize, it's much more than that. So um, I think we need to understand the role of ancestry uh, are there also the issue of land and property um i don't know how this sounds like in in english but in portuguese there is a difference between posse and propriedade uh so so people have no uh, idea of having land as private property because how can you have land which was given by nature as a private property. So when when people about talk about you know ownership and, and tenure and stuff like that, they're not talking about property in terms of uh, private property as we understand it in the Western uh, conception of, of, of it. So that's very important as well. And of course, one of the things that triggers uh, um, you know rural organizing and, and, and land struggles is actually, threats to reverse land reforms that were acquired or were won um, through processes of independence, as, as is in the case of Mozambique. And as I try to argue, um, land is very connected, land struggles are very connected to uh, the long process of liberation. They are not, as we see today in most of the literature, uh, um, something of now of now of, of neoliberalism right it, it's 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 pre, uh, it, 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 it's 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 a it's a longer process right uh of 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 uh, um you know of the struggle for for liberation for dignity for self-determination which of course it has been abandoned by the so-called post-colonial states right because you know they uh constitute uh, you know what we can call 
um, the elite today and uh, uh, build alliance with uh, you know, international or global capital. Uh, and they have abandoned the, uh, the, 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 the struggle for liberation, but those struggles were not, uh, were not stopped. They continue in forms of land struggles today, as I argue. And to make some uh, concrete, uh, sorry, some concluding remarks, and then maybe allow some uh, minutes for, for discussion, I wanted to you know, uh, you know, emphasize that I see land as a key and central element in agrarian movement struggles, in, and having wider meanings and values other than its productive uh, of farming features, um, that rural struggles are a continuation of uh, liberation struggles, and agenda agenda that has abandoned has been abandoned by the post colonial colonial government. Also, that land uh, current rural struggles are intimately linked to you know past processes of resistance, um, and and here most of uh, my. Uh, uh, colleagues disagree, but I have realized that most of militant popular struggles and experiences of emancipation, emancipatory alternatives today um, can be found in the countryside or are related to land, right? Um, and in most cases, rural and agrarian movements are, are, are more progressive than other uh, than their counterparts in 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 you know their urban counterparts. This includes trade unions. Uh, and in fact, I find that uh, trade unions um, have uh, a lot of uh, obsolete elements uh, that are not even relevant today. Um, but this is also another claim uh, uh, which raises a lot of contestation, and I'm prepared to pick that fight. Um, and of course, that uh, you know the diversity in terms of culture, knowledge, history, and political preferences that characterize this movement has been um, uh, used as you know an um, authentic ec ecology of knowledges, um, and that uh, you know w there is there is the, the claim of of a peasant identity, uh, which is a big segment of the working people, not peasant uh, as you know in sort of uh, Marxist term, uh, but uh, peasant as you know, I, and I think in 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 Spanish, um, the concept is much more interesting because it's campesino, right? It's, which is which is which is uh, encompasses um, uh, much more than than a class uh, uh, identification. And I think, um, yeah, I will I will leave it there. And thanks for listening to me. Um there are a few comments uh, I'd like to make first, um, and there are also some questions that are coming up. I mean, I think the important points you make are that the importance of seeing land not only as a productive resource, but as, as a source of history, of culture, of meaning uh, for people. Um, the, the importance of the distinction between private property and, and the the commons and what colonialism has done is to appropriate the commons. Um, I think it's wonderful that you emphasize the victory uh, that was uh, achieved against the Brazilian, uh, Japanese and the Mozambican government. Because I think the point you make about the continuity of colonialism is an important one. But I'm surprised you didn't mention in more detail the collusion of our neo-colonial governments. You know, the Brazils, the Japanese, the Americans, the British, the Europeans could not do what they are doing today without the collusion of our, uh, our own governments. And I think that's something that you need to, I think, emphasize much more. Um, I think the final point you make about the importance of uh, of seeing uh, the campesinos as 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 the heart of small farmer uh, um, movements, it, I think the term peasantry is is inappropriate because it has this European and other roots of feudal uh, as a relation with a feudal estate. And I think Ishtar Shivji's point is that we must consider these as working people, not merely uh, as peasants. And so I think um, uh, those yeah. are some of the comments that I would uh, 
uh, raised. Yeah. There are a number of questions that have come up. Um, uh, it always amazes me how many questions we get. Um, first of all, thank you for the heartening case of victory of the Pro Savannah project. Um, how do you think this was won? And, uh, um, which is often not the case. Um, to what extent are farmers organized as cooperatives? Um, say more about the philosophy behind the question of land. You said it should be not be privatized. Is this a legacy of traditional African thinking? And uh, could you also tell us about the significance of Cabral's thoughts in today's peasant struggles? Um, in your PowerPoint, you said that they are uh, taking away our land, our food, and overall home. Who, who are they? Um, what do you mean by the word they? Is there any national and even transnational agency or land reform revolution in, in your country, in Southern Africa and in the African continent as a whole? Um, is land struggle the base for, for Pan-Africanism? And finally, uh, what are the new difficulties faced with, uh, with climate change? Over to you, Bob. <laughs> yes, I was trying to. I was trying to take notes because I, 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 I did not see the chat myself. I was listening to you, and uh, I was also trying to see if I can respond all of these questions in five minutes because I really need to uh, rush to the airport. Yes. Um, uh, I agree with you, uh, Firozi, that uh, we tend to um, um, sort of. Um, exclude right uh, the role of the state and and the and, and and the local bourgeoisie in our analysis, which I think um, should be more exposed. But I think that we should be very careful in um, in 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 downplay the real power, right? the real power of, of transnational corporations and of global capital uh, in our countries, because without them, uh, even our own bourgeoisie and, and elite will not reproduce themselves. They depend on the, 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 the international capital. So for me, that's the real power that I think we have to confront. And if we defeat that, well, I'm not talking uh, as, 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 as an activist, but if, 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 if movements defeat you know, the, the corporate power, then automatically I think that um, you, know, you also defeat uh, the, the local bourgeoisie. So I think um, focusing on the local um, sort of uh, you know, governments and post-colonial governments without looking at the power structure globally would be an analytical uh, mistake in, as, I, as I understand. Pro Savannah was, was in fact uh, uh, a very uh, rare case of, uh, of, of success for, for, for peasants organizations, but it was not, it was not just um, a, um, an accident that it was defeated. It was like a, almost a decade of, you know, a combination of tactics and strategies and alliances and, and exposing the government and exposing the capital and, you know, traveling to Japan, traveling to Brazil, mobilizing public opinion, media, uh, putting a bit of propaganda, as well as a bit of uh, populism, uh, which was important, but this is a discussion for the day, but I've been arguing, um, you know, um, you know, um, you know, building on 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 June Boris that you know, you know, agrarian movements can also adopt some progressive populism in confronting in confronting um, right wing uh, 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 power. Uh, but this has nothing to do with with today's uh, uh, chart. But I wanted to say that in the struggle against Pro Savannah, a degree of a level of of populism was very important. Um, for instance, in in ignoring that within the peasantry there there, there are differentiation and speak uh, in one voice as if you know the, the peasants were homogeneous. That was strategic because if if there wasn't a class alliance between the various uh, levels of the peasantry, including middle pe peasants, um, uh, the 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 struggle would have been would have been um, different definitely. Um, I, I'm not romanticizing, you know, like 
philosophy, African philosophy around land uh, out of the blue. Uh, this is not like, you know, it's not romanticization. It's actually, if you do a deeper um, uh, uh, research, you will, of course, understand that uh, the ways in which the relations, the relation that people have with land uh, goes way beyond uh, uh, private, private, privatization, right? So, um, and I think there are, they are you know, resources that uh, that uh, also uh, argue argue that way. Um, I think Abral is still very much uh, um, useful today, uh, and I think, of course, we will have to uh, take his teachings and put them into context. But one of the things that Cabral uh, was uh, was very um, in my view, uh, important was the issue of incorporating culture, right, into processes of struggle, right, and and the, you know the issue of you know like the, the you know we have to think as well as we have to act, but incorporating culture uh, um, in the process, and I think that is pretty much um, uh, still very useful, not only in Guinea-Bissau. Uh, but elsewhere uh, in our in our continent, the quote I put that they took everything. It was a quote, um, or, you know, it was actually a direct quotation of someone who I interviewed, who was saying they that the companies, the companies, the elite, they took everything. So that responds to what they is. Um, I really think that I will have to leave it there, uh, Firoz and, and dear um, colleagues, because I really need to rush. I'm sorry for, for this, but I thank you once more for the opportunity that uh, you gave me to, um, to be with you and congratulations once again for the, for the initiative. Uh, Bo, thank you very much for, for taking thank time you, to Rachel. be with us. Well, uh, it, it is actually an extraordinary honor for me uh, to introduce uh, Nimo Basi, uh, friend, a comrade, and uh, someone who I have a great admiration for. Um, Nimo Basi is a director of the ecological think tank, Health of Mother Earth Foundation, uh, with its head office in Nigeria. <coughs> He's an architect, a poet, a writer, an environmental justice uh, advocate, a preacher. His books include to Cook a Continent, Destructive Extraction, The Climate Crisis in Africa, which we published when I was at Pambos of Capress, and uh, Oil Politics, Echoes of Ecological War, uh, which we published uh, at Baraja Press. Uh, he has a regular blog uh, post, which can be found at uh, nimobasi.net. Um, I could speak for, for an hour or so uh, to really give you a flavor of uh, about who Nimmo is, but uh, I am sure I don't need to. Many of you will know it, and no doubt that when he speaks today, uh, everyone will get a, a sense of this extraordinarily important uh, individual who has made so much uh, happen um, in, in, in our continent. So Nimo, a very, very warm welcome to you. Uh, and the floor is of course yours uh, to speak about the cooking of the African continent. Thank you so much, Firoz. Uh, and for your generous introduction. Uh, it was also a big pleasure listening to Boa. And of course, we had to let him go to go somewhere else. His voice is very important in the struggles for the liberation of the continent, especially for understanding the underlying forces that are keeping our people down, people and nations down. Uh, I thank all the comrades who are putting this together. I thank also the interpreters. Uh, I will be speaking, as Firoz has already said, on cooking, the cooking of a continent, which happens to be the title of uh, my book that was uh, published by uh, the Raja Press uh, uh, and of Fahamu also. So we'll be talking about the cooking of a continent and 
the, the whole idea is that Africa has had the un, unfortunate uh, position of being right in the center of the world and being so accessible to the whole world from west, from east, from north, from south, anywhere you can reach Africa and you can just take a boat and sail around the continent. Uh, and so Africa has had pressures from every, every direction. And the other thing that made Africa rather vulnerable was that by the time Africa came into the clash with the Europeans uh, in colonialism, um, the, the continent had developed nations and kingdoms that had very, I would say, without being nostalgic or without being romantic, some continent, some nations and kingdoms that had very strict rules. In other words, places where people respected Mother Earth, respected nature, respected one another, and crime was extremely minimal. And so there were people who trusted another person's humanity as captured in the Africa, African concept of Ubuntu uh, in South Africa or Etiopia in Nigeria, which means living a good life was not about accumulating capital, but about respecting the next person uh, and your neighbor. So in, in this presentation, I'm going to be speaking a lot about the exploitation of the continent in the context of climate change, uh, which is what we deal with a lot in Health of Mother Foundation, uh, which is what also uh, brought me into contact with many uh, other comrades across the continent. And, yeah, and in other regions. Uh, now to go forward, uh, we just, just look briefly at the, a short history of human induced climate change. Now we all know what climate change, we don't need to define it. Uh, it's about a long-term alteration in Earth's climate and weather patterns. Uh, it's not a thing that just suddenly creeps up on anybody, something that's been built up over the years because of human dependence on fossil fuels. You know, we've de humans have depended so much on fossil fuels over the last 200 plus years, uh, but we always think that we cannot do without fossil fuels, or that there was no life before fossil fuels, or that there, there will be no life after fossil fuels. But this, this is the frailty of human imagination that we need to challenge at every turn. Uh, there's been so much research showing uh, that humans uh, humans, uh, human activity is what is driving global warming. But those who are actually behind this horror have spent also a lot of resources uh, pushing the counter narrative that there's no, no climate emergency. Uh, right now, the world, there's more or less a large, large part of the population in the world have agreed, scientists, politicians, industry, they've agreed that human activity is driving global warming. But then the problem is, how do we solve this problem? How is this problem to be tackled? Who is going to do what? And who, who, who would take, who, who would, who would do, what would people do? And we've seen over the years, very uh, dramatic, uh, dramatic changes in the way uh, countries uh, take, take up, they show their understanding of the problem and their readiness to tackle the problem. Uh, right from, at the time we had the Kyoto Protocol in the 1990s, the Kyoto Protocol in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And in that protocol, and up to, especially up to 2009, uh, the conference of parties that took place at Copenhagen. Before then, before Copenhagen, the, the idea was that climate action must be predicated or based on a, a principle, the justice principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. That meant that those who did more to create the problem should do more to solve the problem. Those who do less and are still doing little or nothing to create the climate, climate problem should do something but not to the same measure as those who are benefited from destructive activities. So that, that is generally called the common but differentiated responsibilities. Uh, but from Copenhagen, the, uh, that, that principle required that industrialized nations should 
carry out emission reduction at a, a, a verifiable level and as a binding requirement. In other words, it wasn't voluntary. They just had to do it. Uh, but from, from, the Copen, from Copenhagen, which was COP15, Conference of Parties number 15, the new idea of voluntary actions came into play. And then in Paris, this was concretized as, as almost like a creed for the whole world. And so those who have created the problem and those who are just victims are all, all put on the same, at the same level to volunteer, to make pledges about what pledges about what they're going to do, actually they're going to take. Uh, and this is, we see this as extremely unjust and of course not capable of solving the problem. Because before the last conference of parties of climate change negotiation, which took place in Glasgow uh, in 2021, the United Nations Environment Program did an analysis of the pledges, which is called nationally uh, contri not determined contributions, which we'll discuss further on today in this conversation. When they checked the aggregation of what nations said they were going to do, it was found that um, nothing, everything, uh, the temperature targets of 1.5 as a lower level and below two degrees as the upper level would all be exceeded if nations do what they said they were going to do. They will be talking about three degrees Celsius. And right now we're seeing incredibly high temperatures in parts of the world, if across the world, that if we have a, a regime of more than three degrees, more than two degrees, uh, we're going to have really catastrophic global warming. And that is something we should all be, that's something that should, should guide negotiations and discussions about what is being done. And Africa is most vulnerable because Africa experiences about 50% more temperature increase on the average uh, uh, compared to other regions. So talking about 1.5 as a lower limit of, for temperature increase above pre-industrial level actually means we are permitting temperatures above two degrees for Africa, which will be absolute disaster. Now the map I'm showing on the screen is about the per, per capita emissions by 20, 2009, that when Copenhagen uh, Agreed Accord was drawn up. If you look at this chart, you, you find that the big polluters per capita, uh, Australia, United States, Canada, uh, Russia, uh, European Union, these are the big ones. Come to Africa, you could point at South Africa, then you go to Brazil, Japan, and Korea. Uh, of course, India having a, a per capita, a small footprint right there. Uh, so th this is important to, to see uh, that the entire African continent, apart from South Africa, there, there's little or nothing. In fact, right now, it's generally agreed that um, the contribution of a greenhouse gas from Africa into, into the atmosphere is less than 3% 3, 3 compared to what is coming from everywhere. Then cumulatively, the historic emissions you can see from the bubbles that we have over the map. Again, not little or nothing from Africa, as I said, about 3% or so, uh, but the big chunk of the pollution is coming from the United States, uh, followed by European Union, followed by Russia, followed by Australia, uh, India, China, uh, Japan, Mexico, and, and Brazil. Again, Africa is, uh, is just there to, to, to bear the impact. Now, this map shows distribution of impacts. Uh, it, it shows virtually that all the, Africa is totally crushed by the impacts. And if you remember the earlier chart we showed, Africa has contributed little or nothing. So now, when we talk about climate justice, and insist on those who have contributed most to do the most. Uh, I believe it's just a simple moral question because to, to, to pollute and continue to pollute and continue to insist on the mode of production and consumption that has created this problem uh, and, and not being read and without being ready to, uh, to change, that it means that Africa has been, is being cooked so this is what cooking the continent, part of what cooking the continent means. It means the world, the industrialized polluting world is moving ahead, cooking the continent, seeing Africa for nothing, except as 
uh, as a source, a storehouse for resources. Uh, we're emphasizing this fact. You know, now, Bo Comrade Boa shared this photograph of Cecil Rhodes straddling the continent of Africa uh, and just riding roughshod across the continent in the pre colonial period as well as in the colonial period. And so we, we remind ourselves about history because if we lose our memory, or if our memory is damaged, then this affects certainly the way we relate to our material base. And also, if you lose wisdom and don't learn from the past, then we cannot see the way into the future. And this is extremely important uh, consideration as we move forward. Now, the climate negotiations themselves are nothing but colonial frameworks very colonial talks. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not a level, certainly not a level playing, playing ground, if, if you agree with me. Uh, I'm sorry you cannot see my face. Uh, we had a loss, loss of power over here for a period of time. I hope you see my screen. So I want to request a kindly look at, my, look at the, uh, the screen that I'm sharing, uh, because <laughs> uh, there's little I can do right now to elevate the illumination where I am, unfortunately. Uh, so the United Nations Framework Convention promotes negotiation between state parties and in a very unfair and neo-colonial scenario. And now transferring the burden responsibilities on the victims of global warming. And these are mostly peoples and nations in the global south and especially in Africa and small island states. Um, again, uh, just uh, in the, the major driver of crude of the major driver of global warming is the burning of fossil fuels, transportation, in production, and in other uh, uh, many other um, uh, ways uh, uh, by by the polluting countries. And the polluting countries you can see the chart. The, the, the producers of crude oil. Uh, I know you, some may say where well, Nigeria should be on this chart, but Africa is actually country. Africa is on the chart somewhere, but these are the major ones, the US, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Canada, China. And then in terms of consumption, it's almost the same. You have US, China, you have India, you have Russia, and you have Japan, uh, and this goes on. So um, in a moment, uh, I want to underscore the fact that climate change is a failure of capitalism. Climate change is a failure of market environmentalism. In fact, this is what has prolonged the lack of action uh, from uh, a, a, when countries meet to negotiate and discuss about what is to be done. Market environmentalism has elevated profit and exploitation of nature above any other consideration. Uh, right now, when the world is more or less agreed that climate change is caused by human activities, burning of the, especially burning of fossil fuels, what we're hearing from the corridors of power is that technology will solve the problem. In other words, you can suck out the carbon from the atmosphere by one means or the other. We'll talk a bit about this. Uh, and doing that would now keep you, you can maintain your mode of production and consumption and believe that technology would fix the problem. Again, the fatality of this kind of imagination is, is very evident because none of the solution being suggested is proven and all are dangerous and will still fit into the lopsided power geopolitical power structure in the world. And so climate change continues to, to create a lot of harm and the impact on the continent of Africa is high, extremely high, and alarming. And the solution is not about nature-based solution as being paraded in official circles, uh, which again means uh, commodification of nature. It actually means ref deference to nature, learning from nature, and changing the system. And that is not a cliche, it's not just a slogan. Now, uh, this map, uh, illustrates the um, both the potential for fossil fuel extraction from the continent of Africa, uh, refining capacity, and also the potential for more more reserves being discovered and and taken. 
But what really attracts me to this map, and which I want to share with us, uh, is to remind us that it, most of the resource, fossil fuel resources on the continent are attracting infrastructure from the continent that aids exportation of the resource. For example, a country like Nigeria, Nigeria produces a whole lot of crude oil, exports a whole lot of crude oil, and imports a whole lot of refined products. And currently, the argument by the government of Nigeria, the government of other countries like Uganda, like Senegal, Namibia, Botswana, there, and Kenya, where new oil is being found, the argument is that Africa needs to use this resource to develop, needs use to meet up with what the global north have achieved. That they use this resource to do that. We have to use the same resource to also catch up with what they've done. Uh, it, it, it actually sounds like a very nice argument, but the logic must be tested by what will be the impact if you utilize this resource. What is how would you use this resource? Continue to use this, continue to exploit it without looking at what is going on at the scenes where these resources are being extracted currently. Uh, let me state here that using Nigeria as an example, every oil well or every gas rig is a, crime, is a crime scene because of the massive ecological destruction that is accompanying the extraction of this resource. Uh, so uh, the argument by our politicians that we have a right to extract and pollute just like others have done uh, is a kind of denial of the fact that the oil age is coming to an end. The oil age is coming to an end. The billions of dollars being promised the continent would not change the fact that this is a time for Africa to take leadership, to leapfrog and leave this dirty means of production and go into where the world is going to be moving to. The world is moving in a different direction. We can't wait to become the symmetry for internal combustion engines that will be dumped on the continent when the other continent move away from dependence on fossil fuels. I do know that the Russian war on Ukraine um, and the uh, accompanying with the blocking of food uh, is creating a lot of stress on the African continent as well as other places, especially in Europe also. Uh, but sadly, the European Union has seen the war in Europe and the blocking of the pipelines between Russia, the gradual block on the pipeline between Russia uh, and the rest of Europe as an opportunity to, to open up the taps on the continent of Africa. And so we are finding in, the investors get interested in searching for crude oil or extracting crude oil drilling in Okobango, in Namibia and Botswana. And they're looking for offshore oil and gas of uh, Senegal, planning to extract from Uganda and transport to Tanzania. We'll talk more about that. And happily, we're seeing a lot of resistance, a lot of resistance in South Africa to seismic explorations being pushed by corporations like Shell and others. Uh, we see social forces, the fisher folks and others, communities, people of faith coming together to resist the move to extract uh, resources, uh, fossil resources of the coast of South Africa. Now, at a time when the world should be moving, winding down this kind of uh, civilization, we're seeing um, increasing plans to invest about 230 billion within this decade to be invested by corporations in Africa and about 1.4 trillion US dollars to be, to be invested by 2050 in the fossil fuel sector. So we can see that while the world says we know what's created the problem, it's a denier when it comes to taking the real action. And who would suffer the impact? It's still the African continent, number one, followed by small island states, unfortunately. Now, the argument by politicians that uh, dependence, extraction of crude oil will change the situation is actually very easy to debunk. Number one, a country like Nigeria has been extracting fossil fuel resources since 19. 58 in commercial quantities, exporting this. And we still have a very huge deficit in terms of energy accessibility by the by majority of the people. And so 
10 more years, 20 more years of dependence on this fossil fuel resource would not change what you could not change in 64 years. This is true. And then the sector is not a high employer. It employs only about 1% of African workforce it, right now, the fossil fuel sector. In fact, most of those who work in this sector in Africa are contract staff who don't have uh, who don't have long term long term uh, benefits from the from the transnational corporations. Uh, equally, we note also that about only about five percent of the investment in the sector is actually done within the African economy. And in terms of fabricating the equipment, in terms of other things, the staff staffing and so on, ninety five percent is done outside of the continent. So the continent is simply staying the, as a colonial, colonial source of raw materials, just as it was before colonialism and what it was during colonialism and what it still is today. Uh, it's most unfortunate. And this that we have very reliable natural resources that we should actually be moving to. And let me just mention this about investment in fossil fuel uh, as, as a way of helping the economy. Take the example of Ghana. When Ghana found oil and gas, it, there was a lot of a lot of celebration in that country. And we, those of us who are working to limit the expansion of this dirty and harmful energy resource or source, uh, warned the comrades in Ghana that look what is going on in Nigeria and elsewhere would happen in your country. And they said they could, they thought they could be more do a, a lot more transparent way of handling. Uh, the revenue and all that, but the oil business, all of is not about the revenue. You have to think about life, about the people. But the revenue is also important. Take the example of Ghana. They, this is a, a very uh, strange agreement with those who are developing the gas that Ghana would take 250 to 500 million dollars per year of gas, and if they don't take it, they will still have to pay that money to those who are generally uh, extracting the gas. So you pay for the gas, whether you want it or not. Now, if that is not colonialism, I don't know what else can be termed colonialism. And now the pipe dreams that has been pushed by the Ukraine-Russia war and by insistence on oil corporations to continue extracting from the continent uh, without any sense of responsibility and without caring about what happens to the environment or the people. Now, before, uh, now in Uganda, all have been found in the Hoima area uh, around Lake, Lake Albert. And there's a plan to build a 4,000 long, 4,000 kilometers pipeline uh, that would go from, um, from a pipeline that is 1,000, about 1,400 plus, that would go from Uganda to Tanga in Tanzania. And this pipeline will be heated about 10 times because it's carrying very heavy crude to keep the crude moving on the pipeline. And it's passing, as you can see on this map, by the south, by the western uh, boundaries of Lake, Lake Victoria, which is the largest freshwater lake is in the continent. Now, this pipeline would impact about 40 million people who depend on the Lake Victoria uh, water basin. And if, if you have leakage or some other problems, that would devastate agriculture, food production, devastate freshwater systems, and create a lot of problems. So this is a pipeline of trouble. Not a pipe, not just it's not an innocent pipeline. And one of the drivers of this pipeline, uh, the Total Oil Company, they call it the Total Energies. You know, this kind of change of nomenclature is a way of, of diverting our attention from the fact of what the corporation really do. France has made a decision not to extract fossil fuels anymore in France, but France, a French corporation like Total, are still roaming the continent looking for, for fossil fuel resources. Now, coming to Nigeria, uh, there's been a plan to take, to extend the West African gas pipeline from Nigeria to Ghana on all the way to Morocco and to Europe. Now, this pipeline project has been on for a very long time. It's been moribund, more or less. But um, with the war in Europe, it's become it's getting more attention that you can get gas from the Niger Delta to, 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 to Europe through Morocco. Now, you may be sold the idea that this would help to feed the gas needs on the continent, but you can be sure that wherever this gas pipeline branches to any country, it's going to feed transnational corporations, 
and the main target is to go to Europe. So pipes across the continent are nothing more than pipe dreams. Now let's go back to our discussion about temperatures and how it has been going from, from Kyoto to Copenhagen to Cochabamba, Paris, Glasgow. And next, this year is going to Egypt. Now, as I said earlier, um, Copenhagen brought about a regime of voluntary emission reduction and countries can just, just put on table what they, what they think is convenient to do at a time when the entire world is facing a crisis. Now, progressive governments clearly saw the failure of the voluntary system. And so Colombia hosted the World's People Summit on Climate and the Right of Mother Earth in Cochabamba in 2010. Now, that meeting uh, clearly over just about two days brought about a very, very clear, very clear decision showing that you don't need to have climate discussions every year and every year you are moved, be more retrogressive rather than being progress, progressive. Now the Cochabamba output was the, the declaration of the rights of Mother Earth, which requires real action and requires the payment of a climate debt to nations that have been exploited and that are bearing the impact of global warming. In other words, if the agreement in Cochabamba were used by African negotiators and, and others in the global south to demand reparation from climate harms, from exploitation with accountability and responsibility, which Nkrumah termed the worst form of imperialism, if a climate debt is paid, we would not need to be talking about a climate finance regime within the United Nations Program of Cooperation on Climate Change, which the nations are playing, playing games with. There was an agreement in Copenhagen that $10 billion we gave every, we given every year up to 2020, when that we ramped up to $100 billion. See, for now we still talk about $100 billion per year, but that is not forthcoming, except as loans, but not as what needs to be put on the ground to assist nations to take climate action build resilience and adapt to the impact. And so, so without any real climate action, Africa is still being open to extreme, extreme destruction. And one good example is what has happened on the southeast, eastern board of Southern Africa, uh, where cyclones have been hitting with greater ferocity and intensity over the last few years. Remember in 2019, when Cyclone Idai hit Mozambique and Tanzania and other countries in that region. And over 3,000 lives were lost in one, to one cyclone. And property worth more than $2 billion were destroyed. Now, we've been having cyclones every, almost every year since then, including this year. We had drought in, in Madagascar. We've, we've had, uh, we had drought, farming, almost like farming food shortage in Madagascar, drought in South, part of South Africa. And this has not, is of at all. So the stress continues. And the world continues to move on with voluntary emission reduction. And they're calling the meeting coming up in Egypt as the African COP. And I want to say here that it's a disservice to call that COP, Conference of Parties, an African COP. We've had COPs everywhere around the world, in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia. It was never called the Asian COP, the European COP, the American COP. But now this is fifth time. So we even say this is the first time the COP is coming to Africa. This is the fifth time the Conference of Parties will be held in Africa. It's been held in Nairobi two times, be held in Morocco. It's been, uh, it's been, and now we're going to it's been held in South Africa, and we're going to the conference moving to Egypt. Now, uh, you call it African COP as though it's good action will be taken to, to serve to meet the needs of the continent. As long as we have a voluntary emission reduction that countries can do as they please. As long as the fossil fuel industry populate the corridors of the negotiation, as long as loss and damage have not taken central stage, as long as the big polluters are bringing what they call the net zero notion, then we're still going to see more and more of the same problem. Science clearly shows that you cannot burn the known reserves of oil right now. You can't burn them. You're going to drive the world, drive the planet, uh, the climate beyond what can be uh, I mean, into catastrophic dimensions. But still, 
more investment is still going on uh, in this sector. And it's going on in this sector because, uh, let, let me shift to this now. Uh, the negotiation is tending to suggest that technology can solve the problem. And this technology is mostly solar radiation management uh, in various ways, uh, like pumping sulfides, sulfates into the stratosphere, whitening clouds, pumping ocean water into the clouds to whiten the clouds. Uh, some, some people suggest genetically engineering trees that they can, can have forests of trees that are pure white to reflect, to create the albedo effect and reflect sunlight into the atmosphere, radiation into the atmosphere. Or you could, you could fertilize the ocean uh, with iron filings or some other elements so as to trigger algae bloom. Uh, of course, also the carbon capture, carbon capture and sequestration or barrier of pollution. Now, none of this can have serious effect impact except it's done at a planetary scale. You can't do a small scale geoengineering except maybe to seed the clouds for rain. But if for climate uh, moderation, you're going to carry out these exercises in, at planetary scale and in perpetuity. If anything happens to disrupt the plan, then what, what you try to stop will kick in again and you're going to have uh, that in dimension that you may not be able to control. And now, again, if this is being done by the power bro current power brokers, maybe the rich industrialized nations, uh, what is the guarantee that the impasse will be designed in such a way that it would be less uh, there will be less negative impact on, on the poor, vulnerable nations who are not engaged in these activities, in this kind of experimentation. There's no guarantee that that would happen, no guarantee whatsoever. And so if I'm the one to carry out this experimentation, this planetary uh, experimentation, I'll do all I can to protect my interest before any, anyone else. And this is, this is the reality. And, the, and this geoengineering is currently not being regulated and there are so many other solutions that are coming up that are not regulated and so there needs to be some regulation there needs to be some a moratorium on anything of this nature because to unleash this on the world would mean very horrible uh, consequences for vulnerable nations who don't have any part in it but some people think also that the drive towards uh, this kind of climate engineering may just be a drive for investment in equipment and infrastructure, not really carry out climate action. But if that is the case, it means a diversion of resources from where resources ought to be invested, and that would be a very sad, uh, very sad thing, and uh, a very sad thing to to imagine. Now, talk about the carbon capture and corporate uh, corporate capture. I mean, carbon capture. The New International Magazine published in last month's edition, and I'd like to read this extract from that magazine. It says, carbon capture div divert subsidies from renewables to unproven technologies. The promise of carbon capture and storage is good at making money. In the last decade, over 7 billion was lavished on it $7 billion was lavished on it in the United States. While Shell and ExxonMobil last year bagged $2.4 billion in subsidies for a project in Rotterdam, Netherlands. It's an excellent distraction from the need to face out fossil fuel. I mean, the magazine, New International, has captured this so well. And we can't afford this kind of distraction because climate impact is hitting everyone around the world. And now, at the same magazine further talked about, it looked at the false premises of this kind of cover up that has been proposed, like the net zero. Now, net zero, think about the net zero. I believe participants know about net zero. Net zero is about countries making promises that they, by, by a certain year, they're going to achieve carbon neutrality. In other words, they would not stop polluting but they're going to find ways of offsetting the pollution. For example, a company in Brazil, or let's say a company in Europe, 
will continue polluting the atmosphere, releasing greenhouse gases that is causing global warming, and then show that maybe they go to buy a chunk of the forest in Congo, and they can show that the trees in that forest will absorb the equivalent amount of the pollution they are generating in Europe, and therefore nobody should worry about it. But the fact is that you cannot use arithmetic or mathematics to solve this uh, climate problem. Uh, nothing, no one, no one can tell us that trees will live forever. Trees have lifespans. Eventually they die, decay, and release the carbon that they've stored. And net zero doesn't, it only ex it locks in the present mode of production and consumption and transportation and does not really stop uh, climate uh, people pumping more greenhouse, greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Secondly, I mean, this is why at the last conference of parties, many nations were so glad to just make pledges. The European Union said they would achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, India said they would achieve net zero by 2070. <laughs> Nigeria said they would attend net zero by 2050. The US made their own pledges. You know, when you look at political leaders making pledges that they're going to achieve neutrality, assuming the neutrality was even going to work by 2050, which is about almost three decades down the road. Now, what would be the situation of the world between now and then? What would be the impact of the slow action or no action on generations yet unborn? You can see the short-sightedness of politicians who are looking only about how to sell stories, not action, and then push the burden on young people who will be the adults of tomorrow, and push the burden on the young people to, to try to clear the mess rather than doing something today uh, that, would, that would actually help to solve the problem. And so you have other solutions like the reducing emission from deforestation of reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation, the red plus, uh, which means you pay and you pollute. Almost the same thing as net zero, just that net zero is not immediately tied to cash, but red is tied to so I pay you money, preserve the carbon, keep the carbon, or absorb the carbon, I keep on doing my own thing, carry on polluting. So carbon capture and all these notions of false solutions can be termed corporate capture. They are not climate actions at all. And so we come back to what the issue is. The issue is justice. It's justice. It's justice. I remember in Copenhagen, the leader of the African negotiators, Ambassador Lumumba of Sudan, wept at a press conference and said, any temperature target above one degree would mean cooking Africa, setting Africa on fire. And today we're celebrating 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement, which does not even mean 1.5 degrees for Africa. It means more than two degrees for Africa. The uh, Paris Agreement is something that should be totally renegotiated, overturned. And we should go back to legally binding emission requirement from, on polluting countries to stop polluting at a level that is measurable and that according to science, the voluntary system has failed even as those who are proposing it do know, the carbon budget that is remaining cannot be taken care of by voluntary emissions cut. And if anything, those who are polluting least, least like Africa should have the, the, the scope to take action at a more gradual pace than those who have polluted, their, who have taken up the carbon budget over the centuries. And so the just transition that we talk about must have justice in it. Somebody said that transition is inevitable, but justice in that transition is something that we have to work for, we have to fight for. So when, when activists say system change is not just a slogan, it's something that needs to be done. We need to change the capitalist system, how we produce things, how we consume things, and the, the culture of waste and built-in obsolescence. That means you buy a phone today, you have to replace it next year because a new model is coming up. We have to control even the advertisement levels that pushes the world into overconsumption. We have to move into green 
and renewable energy that is just. Right now in Africa, we have situation, for example, there's a big solar field in Morocco that is, that has, I mean, that is built, that has its own challenges of land grab and of denial of sovereignty of the people of, of uh, Western Sahara. We have a big wind farm in Northern Kenya, the Tukana region near, the, near Lake Tukana, that is creating land struggles and land problems. So whether we're going to green, whatever form of green energy that is desirable, there must be justice in terms of land. As you're extracting the resource to build this equipment, whether from Congo or from wherever, there must also be justice to those who own the land, who live in the territory that these resources are being extracted from. So what must we do? It's time to mobilize more than ever before. The conference of parties come up in, Morocco, in, in Cairo, in, in Egypt, should be a, mo a moment for movements in Africa, movements around the world, the youth movement, Fridays for the Futures, Extreme Rebellion, Friends of the Earth International, Oil Watch International, African Climate Justice Group, uh, the Afroos uh, Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa. They, we must bring all the movements together. This is not a time for professional environmentalists to say we are the ones holding the banner. No, everyone has to come together. And this means the farmers be involved, the fishers be involved. And we're, we're working with fisher folks in the Fishnet Alliance uh, because fishers are the ones first impacted by sea level rise, by salinization of water, by coastal erosion, and by denial of access to fishing grounds because of extraction of other fossil fuels or other minerals in our water bodies. And this, this is being done in the, in, under the beautiful name of blue economy. Blue economy sounds beautiful. Green economy sounds beautiful. But we're not talking about colors. We're talking about human lives. And Africa must def, def, defend her territory against the notions that allows corporate uh, exploitation and political exploitation. I was pleasant, pleasantly surprised recently when we were trying to talk about bringing together activists in West Africa in a climate justice movement. And we saw that there are some hunters, hunters who are fighting for climate, uh, climate action. And I, initially I was shocked, but then I learned the lesson that hunt, in the biodiversity decimated and destroyed, then hunters' business would also die off. So hunters have interest to maintain to maintain access to uh, biodiversity, to protect biodiversity. This is what fortress conservation does not quite do. But that, that really shows that climate change is a matter that needs all movements. It needs gender activists, political activists, economic activists. We need to free the world from all forms of domination and exploitation. Free the world from new liberalism, corporate globalization, neocolonialism, mil militarism, which is one key way of weakening resilience. Imagine the destruction of destruction of, of Libya, of Iran, a bit of Iraq, and now Ukraine, and all the all the violence, violent conflict going on in the Sahel, which could also be tracked to trace to uh, partially traced to global warming. We need to fight against all this. We need to fight against, stand up against the blatant impunity of fossil fuel extraction in our water bodies. I mentioned at the beginning, Africa is surrounded by water bodies and anybody can come from any direction to grab what is what, what should be uh, used for the, on the continent and for the benefit of humanity, of the whole world in res respecting other creatures on the planet. Now, let me mention about why the people in South Africa are doing very well, the fishers and the, and the um, communities. Coastal community doing very well to resist exploitation, uh, exploitation or exploration on their coastline. Now, a lot of crimes are going on in the ocean that people don't easily see. Now, off the coast of Nigeria, south, uh, the south Niger Delta of Nigeria, there's a field called Oruro One. There was an oil gas rig that exploded in April 2020, and there's been a fire burning there, both fire and oil spill has been going on as we speak, more than two years, nonstop. And oil web blowout that has been going on with burning fire in the ocean, spills in the ocean for two years, pumping greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, 
to everybody's detriment. Now, I just say this quickly. If when you hear about oil spills, sometimes you think that, well, it's happening somewhere else, not affecting us. But if a fish is poisoned by an oil spill in West Africa, that fish can easily get to Angola. You can go to the United States and everybody can eat that fish anywhere in the world. And so we have an interest to protect our common, common, uh, the commons, because we are all connected. There are no partitions in the oceans. There's no partition in the atmosphere. We all have one planet and we should stand together. Now I've been reading one book called The Enclave of Exception. And it's very interesting. I find it very interesting. And it talks about uh, the, where the, the, the clash, the coming together of infrastructure and resource extraction. This is clearly what has been happening even in the pre-colonial and colonial period. The Africa, the infrastructure in Africa are all coming from resource uh, locations, going to, the, going to the periphery, going to the, the shorelines and out of the continent. So where the continent remains underserved by resources, elsewhere, people elsewhere benefit more. And this major of infrastructure resource structure resource extraction has opened a new way of transnational capital to operate within national economies and a very disturbing way. And the, the Chinese incursion into Africa is a very good example of this measure of infrastructure and resource extraction because the Chinese are offering infrastructure in exchange, mostly in exchange for resource extraction in, the, in a way that is only slightly different from what we saw in the colonial period. And now also the Chinese and others working the same model uh, are, are, are developing more of what is called in like free trade zones. Now free trade zones are not zones for free trade. They're, they're enclaves for exploitation because these zones, they appear to be located in countries, but they're actually outside of the countries. They have tax holidays. They don't pay levies. They cost or they can bring in an amount of labor they want from elsewhere. And so they just are the, the sitting, they, they are encroaching or that or they are grabbing the territories and making them places of explo serious exploitation. And uh, I think this is one definition of these enclaves of exception. Example is <clears throat> the Lekki Free Trade Zone in Lagos, where the biggest refinery on the continent is being built by someone a businessman who is often referred to as the richest man in Africa. The, the free zone is made, being built primarily with uh, Chinese investment. And building the bigger refinery at a time when fossil fuel should be winding down is a challenge for us to imagine why is this being done? And also what prospect does this have? And how would this benefit? How would this integrate into local economies around when buying things from here will be almost the same as export importing from uh, elsewhere. Now, just as I wind down my discussion, my conversation this morning, I want to mention a bit more. I talk about this in passing, but just talk a bit more about how we need to, under for those of us in Africa uh, elsewhere, we must con contextualize and understand your struggle. Uh, one ECOP here talks about the East African crude oil pipeline that is coming from <clears throat> coming from Uganda to Tanzania. The Okavango, which is a UNESCO heritage zone in Namibia and Botswana, and Recon Africa, uh, a Canadian company, is doing all they can to drill for crude oil in that place and put over 200,000 citizens at risk. We have the Niger Delta, which is extremely one of the 10 topmost, topmost uh, polluted places on earth uh, from where the Morocco pipe, Niger Delta Morocco pipeline is heading, is about to start off to head to Europe. Um, <clears throat> now, we, we, in our context, see these examples, where there are many other examples, we need to identify and realize what first lines communities are struggling and what they are going through and why they need to be supported to ensure that they're not displaced because displacement has impact physically psychologically spiritually culturally and displacement can ruin a people distortion of the people's livelihood and culture it should be taken as something bad.
one of which is the public. And this is where the majority, majority farmers in Africa engage in agroecology. And, and the, the, if you support the people who feed the people who actually hold the power, then it will be possible to stop the destruction that we are experiencing across the continent. So it's time for, as the theme of this series of lectures is about liberation of Africa, we really need to do that very consistently and in total solidarity by understanding our own stories, our own our analysis, knowing our history and context, rejecting neocolonialism, promoting real climate action and climate champions. For example, the Ogoni people in Nigeria. Since 1993, the Ogoni people have kept crude oil in the ground. This is real carbon capture and storage. You don't need to bring it then to capture it. You need to leave it in the ground where it should stay. And then of course, we have to, all of us insist that cooking the continent is not a solution. We need to liberate our continent and we need to give nature and give our people the opportunity to thrive as they ought to thrive. And then we can all uh, uh, rebuild a world that has been taken to the brink. Uh, Firoz, this way I will pause. Uh, I hope there are a few moments for conversation. Uh, thank you for giving me the space to, to share my thoughts. Uh, we have some questions uh, for, uh, for Nemo. Um, uh, could you see also in the chat room? Um, uh, maybe I will read it out. Congratulations, Mr. Bessie, for your uh, splendid lecture. We hear very little of the African perspective. Do you think Africa can follow the path of development without fuel and energy? Or do you think Africa should take a different development path? And, um, and, and the second one, how do you uh, fight the logic of capital? And question three, what can small farmers do in the face of the climate change? Could you propose a coherent ecological paradigm that can also take care of people's livelihood? And um, some comments. Um, as a new government, how to negotiate the change with old government? Scientists, activists, farmers are difficult to push the change. Is this possible to negotiate farm? Uh, government with uh, equality has new ideal governmental stuff. Okay, uh, number four, uh, some people think Africa needs to in industrialize as uh, so has to develop, but I think there cannot be any sustainable industrialization. What does the speaker think? Um, question five, which country in Africa has a better policy on climate justice? Uh, number six, can Africa achieve food sovereignty without mainstream development paradigm? Uh, question number seven, the last one. In your view, how can Pan-Africanism uh, uh, Pan -Africanism have an ecological dimension? Let me try to, uh, Firoz was asking a question. I think I heard the question. Uh, it was, but to what extent will our political elites actually push for justice? And that is a, a tough question uh, because our political elites are busy parroting the positions of transnational corporations of the exploiters. This is what really is very shocking. And they're, they're publishing their opinions in, in Western magazines and journals. They're not even addressing the local population. So they don't publish on the local newspapers or magazines. Uh, so their mindset is to play to the gallery, to play to the same old exploiters, uh, which is which is really sad. So uh, this is a challenge we have. Uh, the, the unholy wedlock of a political elite with transnational cooperation doesn't really allow them to think of the needs of the people of the continent. And so they, 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 buy, the, uh, they buy the slogans that Africa has a right to, to use these resources no matter what. And the question is to what purpose and how have you using it over the past decades? There has to be a change. Uh, so the question whether Africa needs to use a different development path. 
I think that is a very important question. First of all, uh, without being romantic, we need to define development. We have to redefine development in our own terms. Each context must define what they think is development. If, if the way you're moving forward keeps the, disconnecting you from your reality, from, your, from what means living well, from your philosophy of life, from your well being, that cannot be development. We cannot disconnect ourselves from, from Mother Earth and think we're moving forward. So I believe is Africa has opportunity now to actually lead the world in a different direction. And those who want to borrow from her can do so. We need to identify our own logic, our own logic. And this is what some elders are doing in the continent already, uh, discuss with young people and uh, trying to identify what are the things that would help us see clearly into the future without forgetting the past and without forgetting about the knowledge, the store of knowledge that we have. Knowledge that is not defined by Western education, knowledge that wisdom that is being held at the grassroots. So that could help us to develop a, to find a new mode of going forward and define exactly what is development. Development cannot be what was built by colonialism because we're not going to colonize anybody. Uh, it's not likely you're going to colonize or take any set of people into slavery. So it's, we need to look closely at what was done in the past and then decide where we want to go. Then another question was, um, I'm going to skip the difficult ones <laughs> and take the simple ones. The question has so many. <laughs> I mean, somebody asked well, about the logic of capital. I didn't quite get that question, uh, the logic. But you know, we also need to realize, recent in Senegal, and I listened to a young uh, sociologist who said that no nation, no country can be said to be poor. So what I was saying is that we can, just like we cannot use the GDP, gross, gross domestic product, to measure the wealth of nations, we can use capital to define which is a country or continent that is doing well. We have to rethink all those. All those. Uh, the other question was about farmers and climate change. And I think really that uh, our farmers hold the key to real climate action uh, because they don't most of them don't depend on artificial fertilizers. Artificial fertilizers are creating climate problems by releasing, destroying the soil and release, releasing greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So agroecology using natural ways, natural means of protect, uh, of taking care of pests, taking care of uh, weeds, and generally growing the crops, not just give us healthy food, it gives us healthy soils, and healthy soils absorb more carbon, and therefore tackle global warming. So this is where investment should be, supporting agroecology. Anything outside of that is uh, creating more problems. Now, um, I was trying to take notes, Africa to industrialize, no, which country, food sovereignty, uh, food sovereignty is very key uh, because when, we, when you produce foods in a way that is, food sovereignty is simply put, is about being in control of your belly. You grow crops that grow well in your environment, you are using resources that you have. You are growing the crops that you need. Industrial agriculture has endeavored to reduce the number of crops that people depend on for food to just a handful of crops. Whereas we have thousands of varieties of crops and foods. And foods do define who we are to a large extent and what our culture is. Uh, and so food sovereignty is very key. Food sovereignty helps to keep, to cool the planet by using the method of cultivation that is healthy. Now, the final question I would like to try attempt. Now, uh, you can notice that my photo picture has got darker than it was before, just because I'm speaking now without power. <laughs> uh, and so having more years of fossil fuel extraction will not change that if we cannot do it now. <laughs> now, Pan-Africanism, <laughs> can, <laughs> can Pan-Africanism 
uh, would it should it have an ecological dimension? Except absolutely. Now, the African continent in history has been a continent that tribe is very has thriving biodiversity, uh, understands the logic of living in harmony with one another, understands that other species on the planet have equal, uh, they have rights to survive. If I write now, Firoz, we're working on a book of stories on climate change from the animal perspective. Animals are the character that are speaking, tell her what they're experiencing about on climate change. Uh, this is the kind of thing that if we, if we listen to nature, we understand we're moving in the wrong direction and we can help to research our steps. So um, what we need in Africa, Pan-Africanism must embrace uh, eco-socialism. We have to come together to look at how to how to harmonize our living with nature, with one another, with other communities, uh, knowing that we are not the only beings on planet Earth. Um, there is uh, one more question. How can young people hold government accountable for failed policy in implementation and demand for environmental justice? Yeah, that, that last one. And, and perhaps uh, I could perhaps I could just add to that. Um, Boa gave us a very good example of the victory against because we need to know that uh, there are possibilities. It's not all bleak. Um, so perhaps you could give us some examples as well. Uh, yes, the example of Pro Savannah in Mozambique is very inspiring. Uh, that the people stood. Um, stood very firm against that corridor that was copying a mode of production from somewhere else and trying to implant it without regard to the people. So that was a major, major success. Now, in my experience, I would, <laughs> the best example I have of success is the Ogoni success. The Ogoni people campaigned non-violently. Just that time, there were just 500,000 people population, half a million people, Ogoni people, because they had they, they had they, they could articulate their demands what they needed and they had good leadership and they said no clean up our environment don't keep on destroying we need to have, we have a say on what is being done in our territory and even though the leaders of that struggle were killed by the nigerian state with the connivance of transnational corporations the success recorded in 1993 persisted today not one drop of oil is being extracted in Ogoni land. And the people struggle peacefully, collectively. And so standing together, solidarity is extremely important in any struggle. And then connecting with others in other countries, other territories to amplify and to energize that struggle is very important. So young people holding political leaders to account, very easy. Number one is most of these political leaders, they come for election, every four years. If they fail, don't re-elect them, kick them out. If you can call your, recall your representative before they finish that term, do so. I'm speaking to you now from the Niger Delta in Nigeria. In two days, we're having what we call the Niger Delta Convergence. And this is this convergence is it bring us together politicians, uh, traditional leaders, cultural leaders, environmentalists, the youths, the women, all coming together. And the whole idea is to forge a manifesto that politicians would have to endorse. And also to have a manifesto that can guide our work as social and ecological activists. So young people are the leaders today, not the leaders of tomorrow. They should be very active in articulating, having diagnostic conversations that uncovers the problems and also charts the path for the future seeing that political leaders are not ready to look beyond four years. They, they, they point you at 2050, 2060, 2070, because they don't really have interest in the future. So now is the time to have this roadmap drawn by the young people. And young people can also contest political power. There's a movement in Nigeria called Not Too Young to Run. So young people can campaign for that. It's time for the streets to go into the state houses to make the, and also for the cop to come out to the streets so that we can have real solutions to our problems. 
Hey, <laughs> wonderful, Nimo. Um, well, if there are no more questions, we are now uh, just gone uh, 11 p.m. Uh, at your end, uh, Jade? It's almost uh, 11, 10 uh, p.m. in Beijing now, and we have over 1,700 viewers on Bilibili. So, and uh, yeah, today, tonight, and uh, we have the uh, same problem, uh, the, uh, in the uh, suddenly the um, broke out of uh, the electricity uh, in um, uh, Limon's place and also in our place. So we have the same problem with the connector. So um, we share the uh, ecological concerns and also try to find the alternative uh, the, to the uh, capitalism and also the climate uh, crisis. So uh, thank you very much for both the uh, presenters. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. and thank you, Nimo, for a really excellent presentation. Uh, I hope that you will write this up for us so that we can reflect more detail uh, on that. Um, thank you for taking time to, to join us today uh, and your thoughts make a major, major contribution to our understanding of what it means to liberate Africa. Thank you, Nimo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.